Welcome to the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast, the show designed to serve you up evidence-based sports nutrition advice from the experts. Hi, I'm your host, Taryn, accredited practicing dietitian, advanced sports dietitian, and founder of Dietitian Approved. Listen as I break down the latest evidence to give you practical, easy to digest strategies to train hard, recover faster, and perform at your best. You have so much potential, and I want to help you unlock that with the power of nutrition. Let's get into it. Joining me on the podcast today is Christine Yu, who is the author of a new ish book, Up to Speed The Groundbreaking Science of Women Athletes. And I absolutely have loved reading it. And it's really refreshing to read something not by a sports dietitian and not read an article for a change <laughs> that beautifully summarizes where we're at in the female athlete space. So I'm really excited to talk to you and like pick your brain a little bit. I reckon you know more things than a lot of people in the sports nutrition world based on all the research you've done. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Thank you for staying up late for me. Yeah. So before we dive in, can you give me a bit of a rundown about your history as a journalist? Like you're the first journalist I've had on the podcast. Usually it's sports dietitians, you know, other experts in the nutrition space. But how did you land in the world of journalism in female athletes in particular? Yeah, it's a little bit of a roundabout path. So journalism is actually kind of a second career for me. I used to work in the nonprofit sector here in the States doing a whole bunch of other things, but lost my passion for it. And during that period of time, I had started writing again. And mostly it was like for myself, I'd started blogging. This was back in, you know, early 2010s when like fitness blogs and running blogs were like all the rage and everyone had their own blog. But for me, that was really just a reminder or a reintroduction to writing and storytelling and a reminder that Actually, I really kind of like this. And it was really fun to be able to tell stories with folks and really was introduced to the idea of freelance journalism and realizing that, wait, I could actually write about the things that I care about, which is science and sports and health and maybe get paid for it, which was like kind of a novel (laughs) idea at first. But like sports has always been something that's been a part of my life. I've played sports since I was young, always been active. And science has always been something that's been part of my life too. My dad was a doctor. My sister's a doctor. Like there's lots of doctors in the family. I was supposed to be a doctor. So I was pre-med in college. So I've always been really interested in the human body and really just understanding like how the body works, how it performs. And then when it comes specifically to sports was really understanding almost selfishly, right? Like how the body can improve performance, how the body can avoid injury and rehabilitate from injury, mainly because I wanted to know how those things worked for my own, you know, selfish reasons. But yeah, and through the course of realizing that one, I liked writing, two, I could make a career out of this, three, I could write about these areas in which I was really interested in, I started honing in on female athletes, women's health, in part because I felt like those were areas that weren't really addressed well, or there were a lot of questions in those areas, again, partially selfishly, I wanted to know about, but I knew that there was a lot of good information that we needed to get out there. Yeah. And so I've kind of like, made this little niche for myself where, you know, it really is this intersection of really thinking about women athletes, as well as like how the sports science really fits in, and relates to them. And what inspired you to write an entire book on the female athlete, like to dive so deep down so many rabbit holes and piece everything that we know to date together into a book? What motivated you to do that? I joke and say that my agent who had said, like, you should write a book. And I was like, I don't want to write a book. She's like, but you, you should write a book. This is really good. This is a great opportunity for you. But beyond that, really, there were two reasons. One was that Again, it was around the time when I would started blogging more and started doing some more freelance writing. This again, like early 2010s, 2013, 2014 or so, really realizing how little I knew about my own body as a woman and as an active athletic person and starting to understand that like, oh, wait, my menstrual cycle is more than just the couple of days that I bleed. It's actually this whole cycle of hormones that fluctuate throughout the month. And it has all of these things that these hormones do outside of just coordinating fertility 
And I was like in my 30s. And I'm like, why is this like just a revelation now, right? Like, and really understanding the relationship between our hormones and bone health in particular and nutrition and all of these other things that it made me feel like one angry because I wish I had this information when I was younger, right? Like I wish I had this information growing up because just feeling more empowered in terms of just understanding my own body and what that body needs in order to be healthy, regardless of like athletics, right? But just to be healthy and to build a solid foundation for yourself. So on the one point, it was like, I was mad because I wanted this information for myself. And I want to try to get that information to other people. But the other piece of it was, again, through my work as a journalist, I kept talking about and writing about the same topics over and over, right? So talking about things like bone stress injuries, or eating disorders, and body image issues, and oh my gosh, women get knee injuries more than men. And like all of these things where like, there might be some people up in arms being like, oh my gosh, this is such a big deal. We need to do something about this. This is really important. But then it would go away. And then the next year, these same things, like the same type of articles would come up. And it's like, oh my gosh, we really need to do something about this. But then nothing happened, right? I was frustrated as to why we weren't making more progress in this area. And I wanted to understand what the underlying issues were, because I felt like there had to be something, right? There had to be something connecting all of these seemingly disparate issues that was keeping us from making any progress. So on that, what are your hopes and dreams for the book then? It sounds like you've got big aspirations. What's the grand plan? My ultimate hope is that it really starts more conversations about what it means to inhabit a female body and to be athletic and performance driven, or just active, right? What it means to support female athlete health in a way that not just is about performance, right? Which I get it, like performance is really important to a lot of people, but it's really about longevity, really about having like a long term athletic life from when you're young through to when you choose to stop. So it's really about like, Getting information out, for me, the most important audience really was thinking about those girls and the young, you know, the younger girls, their parents, their coaches, so that they had good information, or at least more information than they currently have, right? So that we can really set girls up with a solid foundation for healthy athletic development for the long term. That's my ultimate hope, right? It's like that we can like get it right from kind of the beginning so that we're setting up this infrastructure in place. We're helping them not only know their bodies better, but to make hopefully better, healthier choices so that they can be healthy and happy. And then ultimately, right, you perform better. Yeah, it's really refreshing to hear you say that. My tagline for my business dietitian approved is health plus performance, and we can't have one without the other. And so often, particularly triathletes that I work with, They're always striving to perform better and do the latest thing and all the sprinkles on the icing on the cake, but don't have the foundations of just general healthy eating and energy availability right first. So it's really refreshing because we need to kind of take a big step back from that and go build from the ground up because there's no point doing really high tech, really specific individualized strategies, like particularly with nutrition, if you don't have those big rocks and foundations in place first. Yeah. And I get it, right? Like those higher tech, more advanced things, the gadgets and whatever. It's sexy. It's sexy. It's exciting, right? And like we see the pro athletes do it too, right? You know, we aspire to try to be that and do that same thing. But no, actually, if we just toggle it back a bit and focus on those basics, focus on that foundational level, everything else falls into place ultimately. I honestly learned so many fun facts from reading the book. I definitely take for granted the fact that I'm a female and I exercise regularly and I've been involved in sport my entire life. Like what it was even like 30 years ago or 40 years ago is just crazy and we still have so far to go in this space. But some of the things that I didn't know about were that As a female, we were told not to exercise and overexert ourselves because medical professionals thought our uterus and our ovaries would fall out. Like, it's just crazy. And so as recent as like 2005, women weren't ski jumping because they thought that 
that landing would impact their bodies so much that their uterus might burst. Like, it's just crazy. We weren't allowed to jump until 2014. I didn't know this. So there's so many things that, like I read in the beginning chapters that I'm like, oh my God, I just take that so much for granted. Yeah, that was wild when I realized how recent it was for ski jumping and like the ideas behind it. Like I knew that there was some sort of paternalistic like idea behind the fact that like, oh, they didn't want women to do the big hill ski jump and all of this stuff. But the fact that it was really about this concern that like our uterus would literally burst. I was like, I don't think that's physically possible. And we were impacted in the track and field early days, learning that we couldn't run any longer than 200 metres, because when they did the 800 metres back in 1928, the girls like that broke records and stuff lay on the ground to catch their breath. And then the whole rhetoric around that was like, we can't overexert ourselves because women can't run that far. Like, it's just stupid. So we didn't run further than 200 metres in the Olympic track and field until 1960. And it makes you think, right? It's almost like we're being set up to fail because if we can't achieve it or, you know, it is too like difficult or strenuous for us, then it proves their point, right? And then when you do do well, and in that case, in 1928, all the top three finishers all beat the current world record, like no wonder they're lying down in the infield to like catch their breath and, and rest. But but even with that, it's they're like baiting you, right? They're waiting for you to do this so that it somehow still proves their point. And it's so frustrating. The more you tell me I can't do something, the more I want to do it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So I'm glad that I live now and I can, you know, exercise freely and I'm not held back by like stupid rules. There's nothing that makes me more angry than stupid rules. Yeah. So like it is a beast of a book and you've covered so many different areas. How long did it take you to research everything? Like, how many papers did you read? So I honestly have forgotten what the final count was, but it was several hundred papers. Like, I want to say close to like 600 or so Jesus, around there. That's not easy going either. Like, reading literature is not easy going. No, I had to do it earlier in the day, so I wasn't falling asleep. Yeah, and then also interviewed, I think it was over 140 different people like and those could be of varying lengths of interviews right so that's scientists and researchers medical professionals athletes again at all different levels how many years did it take you to put the book together so i started writing in september 2020 and then i think we put the manuscript to bed may 2022 so about a year and a half Solid. One one of my goals is to write a book one day, (laughs) but I don't have any capacity currently. And like you were so well connected in this space as well. Like I guess that's your job as a journalist, but like I've reached out to some of these researchers and I just hear nothing back. Like come and talk to me on the podcast and it's like radio silence. How did you do that? Yeah, I mean, in part, it was just having had built relationships with folks over the years through my reporting and being really lucky, right? So some of the folks that I'd been speaking with really since like 2017, 2018 around this topic. So they know Mm. me, they know my work. And through them, I've often like connected through other people because it's like I would find someone else or they would suggest that I speak with someone else and I could use their name, right? And kind of name drop and help me get in through the door. But then I've, I mean, I've just found that that community of folks who are really researching female athletes it's a pretty like close knit community, right? There's a lot of folks there in Australia, in the UK, in the US and Canada who all collaborate and work together on a lot of different projects. So it was, <laughs> I feel like I'm like infiltrating into their little like club, you know, I'm like, I'm just don't ignore me. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> like, don't mind me. <laughs> I might need to get you to help me like hook me up or something so I can get a foot in the door because honestly it is the who's who of female athlete like all of the research in sports nutrition and injuries and things like that is it is a book of like who to look out for and what papers to read if you're interested in that space. So when you were doing all that research and reading is there anything that really surprised you that you found out through the process? For me some of the most interesting research that I found was around injuries Again, this might be just a personal bias because I tend to Haven't be injured. you just had a, your second ACL repair? My third. On the same knee? No, no, no. First on, on my left knee. I've had my ACL repaired on my right knee twice. 
But I think in part in doing that research, it was really expanding my lens of really understanding the injury model. Because I think we scientists and, and, you know, even people like normal people, right, we just look at like what happens to the body when it becomes injured, like the wrong step that you take or what have you. And I think for me, it was, yes, understanding that that is a piece of it, but that the injury model and really understanding how injuries happen needs to be expanded a little bit more. We need to understand like the greater context in which you as an actual person are living, breathing, operating, moving within, and how that contributes to potential injury. I think the other part that I was really fascinated by was learning more about breast biomechanics, because I knew nothing going into it. I mean, I think a lot of us have just the assumptions like, oh, boobs move up and down, right? Like they can bounce and jiggle. And that's how we talk about it. But really recognizing that like breasts actually move in this really complicated movement pattern. And that we have to understand what that is, right? We have to figure out how to model that if we actually want to create sports bras that can support that movement and or make it more comfortable, right? But the fact is, is that we haven't really studied it until really the last 20 years or so. Yeah, it's really cool. I love that that's kind of come as a result of this highlight of the female athlete too, because growing up, I had to wear two sports bras to hold those bad boys down, like all through my years of netball and things like that. But now there's products on the market that have that higher level of support that just didn't exist 15, 10 years ago. It's crazy. Well, and I think we're so dismissive of it too, right? Like it's just a sports bra, but really understanding how breast pain, breast movement, and having gear like sports bras really does affect one's ability to participate in sports and how it Mm. does affect, you know, dropout rates of sports, especially among like adolescent girls, right? Like there's a huge drop off there and a lot of it can be potentially be due to breast pain, being embarrassed about how your boobs move. But then we haven't really studied it or like it's often been dismissed in part because the field of biomechanics, there's a lot of men obviously studying it. And so it wouldn't necessarily cross their mind, right, to study how boobs move. But the fact is, is that it can really impact your biomechanics, right? And it can make you less efficient when you run. It can affect like all of these different things that we never really thought about before. Yeah, it's amazing. I used to get headaches like playing netball because it was so, yeah, hard to manage. Like that's why I ended up wearing two sports draws. But I always used to joke about trying to like gaffer tape them down so that they didn't move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and working with triathletes who run, you know, a marathon at the end of their race, like in trisuits aren't built in with shelf bras and things like that. And then I used to struggle with wanting to start the race with what I needed to strap myself down for the run. But mm-hmm. that's kind of restricting to the way that you breathe but thankfully there's lots of products on the market now that help women through that yeah one of the things I really loved about reading your book which again was so refreshing was how kind of impartial you were to the research in nutrition because I'm kind of banging my head against the wall a little bit I get quite frustrated because there's some very loud voices in this space Mm -hmm. that are prescribing really quite detailed individualized advice for women and drawing really strong conclusions from research that's still only very emerging. And it's taking that with a line of caution. And it was so refreshing to hear someone else have that opinion. I felt like I was isolated in that. How did you come to having that, you know, impartial view based on everything that you read and everyone that you talked to? Yeah, I will say I was probably most worried about ruffling feathers in that chapter In part because, like you said, right, like there are a lot of loud voices in this field. I think that there's some friction between certain camps and certain groups and whatever. And being a people pleaser, too, right? It's like, I don't want anyone to get mad at me, right? Like, I don't want to, like, alienate anyone or anything like that. So trying to figure out how to talk about it in a way that that was impartial, that kind of really boiled down to the things that I thought mattered, It was tricky at first, but again, like for me, looking through all the research and understanding, yes, there may be some studies that suggest this or other studies that suggest that. Ultimately, for me, the most important message that I did want to get across was the idea of just like, you just need to fuel yourself, (laughs) right? Like it's just, again, like back to what we were talking about at the beginning, just that foundational 
piece of like having enough energy in your body to do whatever it is that you need to do. Focus on that first. And then like, then you can start playing with some of the other like more advanced nutrition strategies and the like. But that piece for me is like, regardless of whatever level of sports you're at or athletics that you're at, like that's the piece that you need to make sure is in place before doing anything else. Amen. Amen. I loved that messaging. And I was like, I've got to figure out how to do that better because it is about health first. And, you know, do you have a regular menstrual cycle? Like step one, before you start playing around with do this at this phase of a cycle, do this at this phase of a cycle, like, do you have a regular cycle? And is your energy availability right? Like first steps before trying to really fine tune and finesse these more advanced strategies that we're starting to see come out in the research, but we probably will never get to the point of having generic guidelines around that because every female is different and every menstrual cycle is different and our hormones do different things. Like a textbook cycle being 28 days, I don't know anyone with a textbook menstrual cycle. Like the range from 21 to 35 days, the first thing that you need to kind of focus on is is tracking it and seeing what happens for you first and foremost, map your symptoms, see how you feel, and then dabble in some of those strategies. So it's really nice to hear that from, you know, not a sports dietitian, someone that has read all the things, like 600 papers. I learned from that, that I need to figure out how to communicate that better to athletes. It's really hard because I think that that is one thing that I came to realize. Because I think coming into this, I probably thought that, of course, we can come up with some sort of blueprint or some sort of guidelines around this, right? But I think, again, one of the big realizations I had in researching all of this is is just what you said, right? Like every person in a female body, it's so unique. It's so individual. I feel like even more so than when we say like generally, right? Like in terms of everyone's an individual. But I think because of the fact that like, the hormones change so much throughout a month, but change month to month too, right? And change throughout the lifespan. So it's not Mm. like there's this one set thing, like your estrogen will always be at X level, you know, for whatever period of time. But really understanding that is like, oh, wait, there is no one set way that this is going to be or one set thing. And so that kind of really matters, right? Like that really matters in, in how you experience your body, how you experience your training, how you adapt to it and all these other things that it's like, there isn't going to be just one formula that's going to work forever <laughs> for every single person. Yeah, I say that all the time too. Like nutrition is not set and forget, particularly as a female, everything changes yeah. like every year, basically for our whole lifespan, like adolescence and then yeah, through like childbearing years and then perimenopause and menopause and beyond, like it's always going to change. Yeah. So it is a real challenge to distill all of that research that's coming into something that is going to be a clear blueprint. So it was really nice to read that. So based on everything that you have done, where do you think researchers need to then focus their attention so that we can move forwards and get some good information in this space? It's hard, right? Because like, on the one hand, we just need more research, right? Like, yeah, in in this field, looking at populations that are not male, looking at more diverse populations in general, so that we can really understand or just have a broader spectrum of evidence across humans, right? And I think that that in and of itself is a really important thing that researchers need to focus on. At the same time, right, it's like science is about building an evidence base. Like we were just talking, it's about building upon each study, building a consensus so that you can get to these evidence-based guidelines. And of course, we want to build that solid evidence base so that we can kind of understand what is going on or feel more confident, right, to be able to say, generally, this is what we see happen. But as we were just talking about, we can't always depend on those generalizations to be applicable to any one person. So I think Mm -hmm. it's it's this mix of like, yes, doing more research, expanding the diversity of your participant pool, and building that evidence base. But then also, I do think that researchers need to pay attention to the fact that like, people kind of need and want answers now, too, right? So that might mean doing some sort of studies, right, where then you can pull and translate some of that evidence into things that people can do now, or at least start yeah. to experiment with to see if that works for them, right? So it, it mm. is figuring out like, okay, so how do we then do some, maybe it's smaller studies, right? Maybe it's case studies, maybe it's 
I don't even know what, right? But that you can then start to bridge that translational science gap where you are taking new research, but you're bringing it into the real world a little bit more quickly. Yeah, because it is just exploding at the moment. I think that's why those loud voices, particularly in the nutrition space, are being listened to because it is very prescriptive and do this and do that. Yeah. But I think it is important to recognise that it is very merging and we've got a lot of work to do in this space before we have something that's nice and clear. But also, like you said before, it's those big rocks first before dabbling in the more advanced stuff. And making sure that you are eating enough calories. Because the female triathletes that I work with, 95% of them are carb phobic. And I spend the entire first phase of my Triathlon Nutrition Academy program kind of busting myths and getting them to change their mindset around fueling their bodies for performance because nothing's going to work if we don't. And it's quick. Like it's three to five days of low energy availability that we're starting to affect our bone turnover and things, which is crazy. So fast. So fast. And we didn't know that 10 years ago. We need that message out there that nutrition is so important for health, but also long-term performance in that too. Yeah. It's wild to me that the fear of eating carbohydrates is still so pervasive, right? I'm much older than you. Like, it's definitely the tenets of, like, my diets, right? Like, growing up was, like, don't eat carbs, like, low carb, everything. But, like, the fact that, like, we're still talking about this and still thinking of it as, like, this bad food group is is wild to me. Same. But then we went through that low-fat era, too. So then now people are sort of eating low-carb and low-fat. And so what on earth are people eating? I know. It's like, what are you eating? I don't know. (laughs) Rabbit food. I know. So do you have any advice for the female athlete out there listening? I think a big piece of it really is just, it is stopping and tuning into your own body, right? Like, you know, for so long, women and girls have almost been encouraged to kind of leave femaleness, if you will, like behind when you step into the sporting arena, right? It's like you had to ignore your menstrual cycle, you had to smush your boobs down, you want to be like the boys, right, then prove that you could be as tough and all this stuff. But I think in doing that, like, we've lost touch with our own bodies, right? And then kind of it goes back to the fact that we're also not taught about our own bodies as women and girls. So I think it is part just like getting to know your own yourself, understanding like female physiology, what goes on, what your cycle is, and tracking it. Because again, like you were saying, like, there are a ton of people out there ready to like give you like a prescriptive program based on your menstrual cycle or X, Y, or Z, but that might not pertain to you. So like the first step really is to like track your cycle for more than a month, right? Like track it for several months so that you can start to identify like, oh, this is how my body feels, right? Like this is how I always seem to feel week three, you know? So for me, like I tend to feel flat, right? Like no matter what, I'm like flat. And so in the past, I would just beat myself up about that. It'd be like, what's wrong with me? Like, why can't I like hit these times? Or why does my workouts feel like crap? And And it would be my fault. But I think noticing that it was like every third week of my cycle was like, oh, wait a second. Like, sure, it might be because I'm lazy. I'm not really motivated to do something right now. But this part of my actual body may also be contributing to the fact that I don't feel great right now. So I think that that just, again, like helps you understand yourself, your body, and your experience of being in your body while being active, while pursuing the things that you want to pursue. Yeah, I love that. Step one, tune into yourself. I think that's really important. So if you haven't read it yet, go and get yourself a copy up to speed. I'm not sure if this is going to be backwards on the video or (laughs) or forwards. (laughs) I bought mine through Amazon, so I can drop a link in the show notes for that in like an early copy. But it's kind of available everywhere now, like all bookstores, Amazon, online. Where's the best place for people around the world to grab it? Wherever they'd like. (laughs) Whatever their favorite bookseller. It's also available as an ebook or audio book. And so what's next for you then? What's on the cards? What are you going to blow up in the female athlete space next? I'm not sure yet. I don't have kind of a firm second book idea. I'm kind of still looking around and poking into a couple of different things. But second book, there you go. You heard it here first. (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) There's so many different areas and rabbit holes that you could go into. And, you know, research is just exploding in this space. Are you still reading the papers or have you like tapped out for a little bit? I've 
tapped out for a little bit, yeah, but I'll still, enough. yeah, I'll still see papers come across like social media feeds from, from some folks that I follow and like, I'll email them to myself and eventually I will read them. If you leave it too long, you'll have another 600 to get through. It's just exploding at the moment. Yeah, but it's exciting. Oh, yeah, it's so exciting. It's the best. I'm, like, struggling to keep up with it. So it's nice to have a good little summary in this <laughs> book to read and be like, I didn't think about that one. Like, the stuff around concussions not really appropriate for me as a triathlon sports dietitian. So I found that really interesting to read because I didn't know that females suffered from concussions so differently to males, and I'm a total science nerd as well. Yeah. And the reason of that, like the axons and stuff, I was like, yeah, this is like the best. Yeah, totally nerding out on that part. And when I was talking to the doctor and the researcher who was doing that, it was like, it was fantastic. I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm not using half of this, but I'm just so curious. Yeah, it's amazing. The body is an amazing thing. Yeah. Thank you so much for yeah staying up late to talk to me about female athletes. I think it's a very much a conversation that we need to spread far and wide and we need to normalize talking about all the weird and wonderful things that happened in our bodies so that we can perform to the best of our ability. I just feel like we've been squashed in sport for our entire history and like the, it's unleashed now. Like yeah. look out. Yeah. Well, that's the exciting thing, right? It's like if we've been like constrained and held back in so many different ways, you know, over centuries, right? It's like, imagine what is possible when we actually give women the resources that they need, give them the education and the knowledge, like allow them to actually do the thing, right? And not hold them back. Even tennis, like tennis, we still only play three sets and the men do five. Like, come on, yeah. sort it out. Yeah, it's wild. It is wild. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I'll drop the link for the book in the show notes, but definitely go and give it a read. Any female athlete, no matter what sport you're in or where you're at, it's definitely something that you should add to your reading list. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Triathlon Nutrition Academy podcast. I would love to hear from you. If you have any questions or want to share with me what you've learned, email me at podcast at dietitianapproved.com. You can also spread the word by leaving me a review and taking a screenshot of you listening to the show. Don't forget to tag me on social media at dietitian.approved so I can give you a shout out too. If you want to learn more about what we do, head to dietitianapproved.com. And if you want to learn more about the Triathlon Nutrition Academy program, head to dietitianapproved.com forward slash academy. Thanks for joining me and I look forward to helping you smash it in the fourth leg. Nutrition! Nutrition!